A portion of this video is sponsored by World of Tanks Blitz. While there's a good number of ways that somebody can describe Nintendo's follow-up to the NES, the Super Nintendo was certainly super, way cool, awesome, and groovy, but it isn't just the console that fits these descriptors. Super Mario World pushed the Mario series to new extremes, not just in gameplay, but even in the language it used. In the Western localization of the game, the names of levels in the special world made use of typical 90s American surfer lingo, utilizing descriptive words like gnarly, tubular, way cool, awesome, groovy, mondo, outrageous and funky. It's moments when you acknowledge inherently localized language like this that begs the question, what were the names of these levels in the original Japanese version? Well, bizarrely, a bunch of these levels actually all share the same name. The first two are both called Fun Course, while the third and fourth are called Even the Mario Staff is Shocked Course, Fourth Wall Be Damned. Levels five and six are both Specialists Course, while the seventh and eighth courses are both called Championship Course. None of the shared names are even differentiated through numbers like Fun Course 1 or Fun Course 2. Every now and then, Nintendo will grant interviews to a lucky few journalists. And every now and then, these interviews won't just be fluff to promote a new game. In 2020, journalist Steven Totillo got to interview some key developers of Luigi's Mansion 3, but also ended up getting some insight into a link to the past's production as well. At E3 2019, it was implied that Luigi's Mansion 3's hotel setting would allow for multiple floor puzzles, since the layout of the hotel would be easy to visualize. However, this idea was scaled down to multi-room puzzles due to the difficulty of designing challenges across several floors. One developer who was a part of the Tortillo interview was Luigi's Mansion 3 producer Kensuke Tanabe, who also happened to be the scenario writer on A Link to the Past. And when the topic of the multi-floor puzzles being cut was brought up in the interview, Tanabe compared it to content being cut from A Link to the Past. Tanabe stated, when that happens, I try not to cling to that initial idea too much. For example, this is when I was working on The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. At first, we were thinking about structuring the game with numerous parallel worlds. However, in order to establish the gameplay in the end, we decided that it would be much better to narrow it down to two worlds, light and dark. I think game development involves much work where you never know unless you actually test it out. So it seems like A Link to the Past was at one time a much more complicated game. These early stages of a game's development are definitely one of the more interesting things to reflect on after a game's release, especially when the final product ends up being very different. Donkey Kong Country has an interesting history in this regard, with its origins leading back to a pitch made by Rare to Nintendo during the mid-90s titled Donkey Kong vs. Super Wario. The game's original premise was that Mario had invented a time machine, but Wario managed to sneak into his laboratory and used it to acquire a futuristic beam gun that he then used to turn Mario into stone. Wario then proclaims that he'll use his new weapon to rule all of, quote, Nintendo land, but, unbeknownst to him, a parrot in the corner of the room witnessed everything that took place. The parrot goes off to warn Donkey Kong, who immediately decides to stop Wario then and there. In the end, Nintendo rejected this pitch, but they did ask Rare to create an entirely new collection of enemies for the game rather than falling back onto Wario. The result of which was the creation of the Kremlings and the development of a new pitch title, Donkey Kong and the Golden Bananas. This second pitch had a different plot, this time revolving around a golden banana stolen whilst under Donkey Kong's protection after he fell asleep during guard duty. The Golden Banana was a relic sacred to his homeland now stolen by Corporal Krizzle, an early prototype Kremlin prior to the creation of King K. Rule. Grandpa Kong, an early prototype version of Cranky Kong, wakes Donkey Kong from his sleep and tells him to rescue the Golden Banana, as now the entire island was at stake. But before setting off on his adventure, Donkey Kong enlists the help of Junior to retrieve it, an early prototype version of Diddy Kong. This idea would ultimately evolve into Donkey Kong Country. Sometimes developers have grand ideas for their games, but when it comes to the final release, they may have overlooked some important details leading to bugs and the like. This can range in scope from massively detrimental and game-breaking glitches to perhaps not that big of a deal because the issue is hidden away behind some sort of game mode that most players don't even know is there. Such is the case with Super Mario Kart.
But before we dive into this piece of trivia, a word from this episode's sponsor, World of Tanks Blitz. World of Tanks Blitz is a legendary MMO shooter available on Nintendo Switch, PC, and mobile devices. And it's even cross-platform, so players can unite on different devices. The game is a fun and lighthearted take on the shooter genre that bends the rules of reality and puts an engaging twist on tank combat. Blitz has over 400 lovingly crafted vehicle models that not only authentically recreate historic tanks, but also bring life to a new slew of unique and fantastical vehicles from alternate realities. The game's deep mechanics, fluid gameplay, and tactical diversity have helped build a community of over 140 million players from across the globe, and is constantly updating with new events and features. Blitz is a game that constantly surprises, entertains, and brings new experiences to and outside the battlefield. Join World of Tanks Blitz now and you'll get a special gift which includes the German heavy tank, animated exclusive camo, and seven days of premium account subscription by using the code WOTBLITZ23 when creating a new account. To sign up, simply use the link at the top of the video description. Thanks to World of Tanks Blitz for sponsoring this part of our video. And now, back to Super Mario Kart. In the game, there's actually a secret CPU ghost mode which can be accessed under the time trial menu by simply pressing start on the controller in port 2 while selecting a driver. This triggers a CPU cursor to appear, allowing the player to select a ghost driver to compete against. This is where a unique glitch can come up, as these CPU ghosts are capable of interacting with elements of the track's mechanics, such as the ice blocks found in Vanilla Lake. By selecting a CPU ghost to race against and allowing the CPU to destroy these blocks, if the player then drives over where these blocks were and then saves this new race as a ghost, an oversight will present itself. In this new ghost race, the ghost will vanish when it touches the block that was supposed to have been destroyed and trigger a bizarre visual error in which the player's tires will cycle between two frames of animation even while in an idle position. This error only comes up when using the same driver as the ghost, however. The SNES was a bit of a juggernaut when it came to racing games, with Mario Kart being a great example of how the system utilized its pseudo 3D mode 7 effect to create the illusion of depth by manipulating a 2D plane. The same can't be said for the original NES, unfortunately, with even Nintendo of America being rather scathing about one particular release, Famicom Grand Prix 2, 3D Hot Rally. Kazunobu Shimizu had worked on the game as a designer and revealed that Famicom Grand Prix 2 was the game that inspired him to create what many consider one of the best racing games on the Super Nintendo, as well as one of the best uses of Mode 7, F-Zero. During an interview, Shimizu revealed that he and his team showed Grand Prix 2 to Nintendo of America and they quote, totally bashed it, and that they told him, this isn't a racing game, racing cars should be cooler, and that it would fail to sell. This awakened a fighting spirit in the would-be director of F-Zero, who thought, well, if that's what you say, then I'll make something really cool. We can all get stuck in a game from time to time, and Super Metroid is one of those titles that can be a nightmare to navigate. Trying to find where you need to go is tricky when you don't have any sort of map to guide you, but there was a map created by one of the game's Japanese developers for their own reference. In 2018, this developer map was scanned by TJ Rappel and uploaded to Metroid Database. Some of the details on this map demonstrate changes made to the game during its creation, such as Krokomaya being listed as Tokera, derived from the word for melt. Tokeru, and what could be construed as a pun for the name Godzilla. Gojira, Tokeru, Gojira, Tokera, essentially melting lizard. It wouldn't be surprising, since it's already well known that the devs were big fans of the monster movies. Fantoon is another example, with its name on the map being Obaken, derived from the word for ghost or phantom, Obake. So Fantoon is actually a pretty decent way of demonstrating that. This map actually has a deeper history within Nintendo too, having later been used by Nintendo's gameplay counselors in the United States. If a gamer wound up getting stuck, they could call up these counselors for advice on what to do next. While Super Metroid has no difference between its Japanese and US releases, at least when it comes to the room layout, Nintendo was still concerned that if the counselors referenced this map for their guidance, they may wind up giving players misinformation, as those in charge weren't completely sure if there were any differences between the two language versions of the game. However, even with the ban having been put on place on the use of this map, counselors would still use it anyway, just in secret, hiding copies of the map in the backs of their information binders. One game actually did receive a substantial change between regions, and arguably one that ruined the entire experience in the English release, The Legend of the Mystical Ninja featuring Goemon. When porting the game overseas, the 
the team decided to make a cut in Warlock Zone 3. In the original Japanese version of the game, a show would play out on screen performed by Ebisumaru, known as Dr. Yang in the English version, who would dance around for a little while before dropping trow and letting out a little fart. What's curious about this scene is that while entirely optional, it was referenced in the English release's instruction manual with the name Sammy Rise Circus Sideshow. It was even included in issue number 33 of Nintendo Power and even in a Prima guide, which means that it was likely removed sometime between having been distributed to media for coverage and its final release. Another show was removed from Warlock Zone 6, where in the original release, it was possible to enter a geisha strip club, and even the option of watching a strip show. Though, sorry to disappoint everyone, there is no explicit pixel nudity to be seen. The biggest insult is removing the fart scene though, because that is definitely peak humor right there. On the subject of comedy, swearing is something that most children find inherently hilarious, regardless of its context. In the secret of Evermore, it seems that the American team at Squaresoft knew their audience of rebellious gamers would be keen to insert any profanity into the game they can. So, they prepared a special prize for anyone who happens to have entered their name as the F word, specifically with the correct grammar as a proper noun using a capital F. At one stage in the game, the player will be faced with having to cross an alarmingly large desert on foot, with the only option of transportation being a skeleton sand sailor who will transport the player on his boat for the price of just one amulet of annihilation. However, if the player has their name set to the F word, he will instead up his price to three amulets, citing his distaste for foul language as a justification for his steep price. But this is far from the only secret in the game. There's a reference in the introduction in the town of Podunk, where the store can be seen with the name Dughead Software. This is actually a double barrel reference, both to the software retail company Egghead Software, who ran from 1984 until 2001, as well as to the game's executive producer and creator of Load Runner, Doug Smith. Smith may even be the reason that Seeker of Evermore exists at all, according to the lead programmer Brian Fadral, who credits him with the conception of the game, and who explained that Squaresoft hired Smith based on his proposal for an RPG with an American motif. The Japanese RPG giant loved this idea, and so they set the team to work on creating a game like Secret of Mana with Western themes. And what could be more American than a small boy traveling through time, making references to American pop culture, all while dressed as Marty McFly from Back to the Future. When it comes to Japanese games though, sometimes the region doesn't quite get the full experience we do over in the West. Mortal Kombat 2 is a game that many will know for its early gory details, with characters being torn limb from limb and bleeding profusely all over the place. For this game's Japanese release, however, much of the gore has been censored, with all of the blood having been recolored to green, while all of the game's iconic fatality moves, with the exception of the stage fatalities, causing the game to become temporarily monochrome. Mortal Kombat is of course a western developed game, so at least Japan was lucky enough to even receive a release, a privilege we often didn't have over here when it came to games created over there. While Squaresoft has created and released a number of popular JRPGs and had them ported to the West, like the monumentous Final Fantasy franchise, this wasn't always a given when it came to their standalone titles. Live Alive is one of these games, a title that mostly received recognition outside of Japan from diehard JRPG enthusiasts, partly thanks to fan translations released during the early days of the budding fan community. Many moons later, it would be given a full English localization with its remake for the Nintendo Switch. Those who have played the game will know that it birthed a fairly unique concept in the JRPG genre, with gameplay taking place across a variety of short stories with their own environments and characters, rather than one extensive continuous plot that can rack up tens of hours to complete. Takashi Takita, the game's director, was asked in a 1994 interview for Famicom Sushin magazine what it was that made him want to create the game. He responded that his main idea spawned from Square's work on previous franchises like Final Fantasy and Hanjuku Hero, and now he wanted to change the formula to something fresh. From here, his concept of a world select screen was born with the hope that he could breathe some fresh air into a genre that had been mostly stretched to its conceptual limit at this point. This would also provide a lease of new life for the team's development process with the possibility that it may even enlarge the scope of the gameplay. Many would agree that, in the end, his concept worked rather well in its execution. 
Before they were bought out by Square, Quest were the development team behind Ogre Battle, a tactical RPG series that saw its initial publication on the NES. While a Japanese-developed game, its world feels far more encompassing than just the East. In fact, many of the game's locations are not actually inspired by Japanese cities, but rather Brazilian states. This includes the state of Acre, found in the Amazon rainforest, and Para, while others were renamed. Goyas was based on Goyais, Matgro based on Mato Grosso, Lolaimia based on Joraima, Melanion based on Maranhão, Rodnia based on Rodonia, Alagoas based on Alagoas, and Seljip based on Zehajipi. Apologies to our Portuguese speakers out there. While these names were kept across the game's different localization, the American release of the game had the name Seljip changed to Veer. But as a result of this, there's an oversight in the game when an NPC will still mention this location by its original name. This next piece is somewhat a recent piece of trivia, but it's one that relates to a friend of the channel. Cool Spot was a game created specifically to promote the soft drink 7up, a fact that was easy to miss with the game's international localization, as many references to 7up were removed for the overseas market. With America, however, it came as no surprise when players saw that the game's original manual had a promotional campaign that gave players a chance to win a cool prize if they beat the game on hard and collected all six uncola letters along the way. If they achieved this, they'd be greeted by a screen of Spot holding a camera instructing them to take a picture of their screen and mail it to an address in the game's manual, the headquarters of Virgin Games. This contest ended on December 31st, 1993, roughly eight months after the original Genesis version was released, and not even four months after the SNES version was released. According to a TV Tropes entry, the prize was allegedly a cheap plastic spot toy, though there has been no official confirmation on what prizes were awarded to winners, if any. Where this gets particularly interesting, however, is that one known winner of the contest years after the fact was a fellow YouTuber, Gerard the Completionist Khalil, who reviewed the game and, instead of sending his screen to the now defunct Virgin Games, decided to tweet it out to 7up's official Twitter account in 2014. This caught their attention for being crazy old school and incredible, resulting in them DMing him and asking for his address to send him a prize. The following week, a bizarre PR stunt took place where two 7-Up women arrived in the completionist's office, bringing with them a pallet of assorted 7-Up drinks, as well as free sunglasses and loudspeakers. Gerard said, they had no idea why they were there. I didn't know why they were there. It was an overall weird experience to say the least. It goes to show that it's totally worth shooting your shot even if you're 20 years late. Changing gears a bit, the horror genre didn't really kick off until the next generation of games, with the more realistic graphics of the PlayStation being able to truly make players feel a deeper sense of dread. But the Super Nintendo was a bit of an early adopter of the genre, touting titles like La Place Normale and of course Clock Tower. Clock Tower's most recognized fright is the game's murdering psychopath, Scissor Man. But according to Hifumi Kuno, the game's director, Scissor Man may not have been as unique to the franchise as some people might think. His appearance and signature blades were hugely inspired by another horrifying figure found in the film The Burning. Kuno stated, The idea of Scissor Man's blades comes from watching the movie The Burning when I was a child. A scary backlit silhouette of a murderous demon with his garden shears sent shivers down my spine. At least he wasn't inspired by Edward Scissorhands. There's no faulting someone for taking inspiration from something striking, but sometimes inspiration might just be straight up taking. In the case of Demon's Crest, the game's official soundtrack was included as part of a collection containing the music for the various games in the Ghosts and Goblins franchise, with it having been a spin-off. However, none of the game's music had official titles prior to this release, and it seems that some of the titles chosen weren't originally from an official source either. The music's track names were all created by a user of snesmusic.org named Squaretex, and it appears that Capcom just took the unofficial fan names for this official physical release. Whether or not the company was aware that these names were made up by the fans is another matter, but one can assume that they just believed that they were the original names created by the game's composer. Speaking of the game's composer, the musician was actually unknown for a long time due to the lack of a credit sequence. Many had assumed that the game was composed by Yuki Awaii, who worked on the previous game in the series, Gargoyle's Quest 2. 
She'd also composed music for Mega Man X alongside Toshihiko Horiyama and wound up being the sole composer for Mega Man X2. However, the veil of confusion was lifted when this musical collection was released, with Ippo Yamada, the game's sound designer, confirming that it was in fact Toshihiko Horiyama who composed the game's score, and had previously worked on a number of games in the Mega Man series. There was a time when the Mega Man series was considered a Nintendo console staple, before the character's expansion into the wider gaming market. In Mega Man 7 on the SNES, it seems the devs at Capcom wanted to pay respects to the system's predecessor in Japan, the Famicom. At the very beginning of Junkman stage, it's possible to see what looks like a Famicom hanging from the ceiling, though not quite matching the same design as its real-world counterpart. Early versions of the game reveal that this design was altered at some stage, however, with the original version looking significantly more like the original system, with the final retail release having been rounded off at the corners and slightly disguised. This bizarre Mega Man version of the Famicom even appears multiple times in the background of this stage, but was likely overlooked by many any fans at the time. It wouldn't just be Nintendo's home console that wound up getting some love in a mysterious place in this game though, as commanding Rush to search in a spot that doesn't have anything in it has a chance of him actually digging up the original Game Boy handheld. Some things in games need time before they're fully recognized, whether developers wanted them to be acknowledged or not. Star Trek The Next Generation was perhaps one of the most quintessential 90s sci-fi TV shows, so the fact that there'd be a collection of games for the series is no shocker, like with the SNES title Futures Past. Over the years, it became much easier to acknowledge the fact that lots of the still images from the game are actually digitized screens taken from a wide array of episodes from the TV series. This includes scenes like the the still frame of Captain Picard in his ready room, which appears in the episode Lonely Among Us, while an image of Dr. Crusher providing aid to an injured crew member is from the battle. Sometimes the show might just have a shot worth using for the game, but with the cast's appearance changing over the show's story, some alterations had to be made for certain scenes, like this still frame of the crew hanging out in the observation lounge, which comes from a scene in season 1 episode The Neutral Zone, requiring the artist to make changes to both Troy and Worf's uniforms, as well as painting the iconic gruff beard on Riker's face. While these shots all show crew members iconic to the next generation, the game also features a number of crewmates who were original characters just for this title. These characters were all named and modeled around the likeness of the team behind the game's creation. There was even a character based on the editor of the Electronic Gaming Monthly magazine, Ed Shemrat, either as a form of appreciation for his work, or perhaps as a way of trying to convince him to give the game a solid presence in the magazine. Who knows? Checking back to the EGM issue of the game's release reveals that there is an extensive article covering the game, but without any mention of Ed Chemrav's appearance in the game at all. Curious. It's possible, of course, that the team at EGM wanted to keep this cameo a secret, as some secrets can remain undiscovered in a game for some time. Did you also know that Boo's Fury on the GBA went under several unused titles and once had a cute cat as every single character portrait? Or that the staff on Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire had to cheer each other on just to get through the day? For more facts on Game Boy Advance games, check out the video on screen. Don't forget to subscribe and thanks for watching.